My name's um, Ewan Harvey. I'm a professor of marine ecology at Curtin University. And what I want to do today, if I can get the computer to go through the first slide, it's a little bit slow, is I want to talk a little bit about who I am, um, what I do. I also want to make a, a bit of a plug for marine science because marine science is often misrepresented or misunderstood. And people think marine science is marine ecology or marine biology, but it's much, much more than that. And then I'm going to take the liberty of changing my titles because I saw on one of the WOMSI talks that's, that James Tweedley at Murdoch had already spoken on artificial reefs. And what I thought I'd do is I'd keep the theme very similar, but I'd scale it up and actually start talking about man-made structures rather than just artificial reefs. So first of all, um, let's go to who I am. Um, I've been at Curtin University for much to my surprise for uh, eight and a half years. Prior to that, I was at UWA and coordinating the marine science program and doing research for 14, 15 years. Um, I'm from the, I'm actually Kiwi. I'm from the east coast of the North Island and a small place called Ashley Clinton. I grew up on a farm. Um, I know far too much about shearing sheep, driving tractors, baling hay, doing all those sorts of things. But there was a time when my father said, look, you know, you've got to get out and do something else. You've got to use your brain. Um, you're not going to go farming. We don't have the money for you to go farming. What are the other things that you're interested in? And I was really interested in conservation and conservation management. Um, went overseas on a youth exchange program to South Africa, missed out on the course that I wanted to get into. And then when I came back, I went to a university in Palmerston in the North Island uh, doing a zoology degree. And after about four months of playing rugby, playing basketball, volleyball, um, everything else that I probably shouldn't have been doing, I was advised by a very wise man that I should withdraw and go away and grow up for a couple of years um, and go and do the thing that I really wanted. And I was averaging Bs at that point. So, um, yeah, you know, that, um, that was a wise bit of advice. My father got me a job in an abattoir and a freezing works where I had my neck broken three or four times and ended up... Um, Sorry, I had my nose broken quite a few times, my neck broken once, which made me have to rethink my whole career. So up to that point, um, I was a mad king fisherman uh, doing a lot of trout fishing. When I broke my neck, I got really heavily into surfing um, and was the secretary for the New Zealand Surfing Association. I'm a certified um, coach and also judged on professionally on the New Zealand circuit. I love water sports. I've been windsurfing for over 40 years, which gives you an idea of my age, and I'm still going hard out. Um, one of my goals this year is to complete, compete in and complete the Ledge to Lancelin. So I do everything that's water-based. I eventually went off to a university in the South Island, uh, just outside of Christchurch here, to do um, a degree in conservation management. Um, and at that stage, I was going to be a park ranger, terrestrial park ranger. Um, I took a little bit of time out and went up to the top of the North Island and worked as a park ranger and figured out that at that level, it meant I was cleaning toilets, doing campground management and doing uh, pest management. From there, I decided, well, from there, I also went um, commercial fishing, did a TAFE course in marine science where I got all my dive tickets, all my boating tickets, all my VHF tickets. And then went back to Otago University, which is in Dunedin, almost at the bottom of the South Island. And um, basically did my PhD there. My PhD was based over in Fiordland on the other coast, up past Tiana. And I did something like probably a thousand hours underwater over the three years, three and a half years that I was over there, which was pretty amazing. Cold water environment, um, very steep. Uh, very deep and dark and still representing a deep water habitat. For my PhD, I ended up doing a lot of work on underwater stereo video as a way of surveying fish. And for those of you who don't know, basically an underwater stereo video is two cameras. They are set a set distance apart. 
we know the orientation of the cameras, both inward, um, the role of the cameras in the housings, the distance between the cameras. And from that, we can calculate all of the different parameters and use it to measure distance, angle, length. Um, if we're measuring the length of a fish, we can get a, a biomass or the volume of an object. We can calculate swimming speed. And for what I'm interested in, we can actually measure something to within uh, less than 1% of its real accuracy. And that has meanings in ecology. So I've effectively become a fish ecologist. And a stereo video is basically a, a tool for fishery independent uh, sampling of fish, counting and measuring the length of fish. So in fisheries and conservation management, what is it that we actually want to do? Well, we really want to be able to identify specific species. We want to be able to make counts of abundance. And where we can, we want to be able to make length measurements and where possible, determine the sex of the species. And this is really hard for fish. We do have some species like the Western King Rass that's in your picture now, Chorus auricularis, which is probably the most common fish on this coastline. Um, you've got a female on the left and you've got a male on the right. So they have different coloration and they're different sizes. So that's the basic stuff that we wanna be able to get. It's the basic information. So over the years since I did my PhD, um, We've modified stereo video into many different formats. One of them is beta remote underwater video systems. So you'll see that we have the two cameras, we have a frame, this one's a deep water system. So we have a light, we have a bit of bait out the front and it's very much like a, a fish trap, except we're not capturing fish, we're filming them. And we can deploy in multiple habitats from really shallow water. So the top is at uh, the Hartman Abrolis and down to really deep water. The bottom image is from New Zealand, and we're recording down to two and a half thousand meters with these systems using ropes. In Western Australia, we've gone as far as 650. And the baited cameras are a really good cost-effective tool that can collect a lot of very good information quickly with high statistical power. So We've also modified these systems so that they're used by scuba divers rather than divers actually doing counts of fish. And we've got a lot of standard operating protocols that have been accepted around the world. So these systems are globally used now. And over the last five or six years, we've modified them so that they can be used with small remote operated vehicles. The little ROV on the right is a Blue Robotic uh, Heavy Duty uh, 2. It's a kit set that comes out of the USA. It's worth about five or $6,000, and they're really amazing. I've got three or four of these systems at the moment. Um, incredible what they can do down to 70 or 80 meters. And one of the reasons that we're going this way is that particularly with the work that I do on the South Coast, we've had a number of interactions with some quite large sharks. And it's getting to the point where I'm not prepared to lose a diver to a shark attack, but I don't mind losing an ROV. So we've got depth and safety considerations where if we use a, an ROV, we can eliminate a lot of that. So just to step back a little bit, I came across to Western Australia in 1998 um, when my partner said, guess what, I'm moving back to Australia. And I thought we were going to be here for three months. And that was 24 years ago, and I'm still here. Um, I've now taken out an Australian passport to venture, uh, finally, because I realise I'm not moving back to New Zealand. And there's a lot of things that have encouraged me to stay in Western Australia. The marine environment is absolutely incredible. And one of the things that um, I find absolutely fascinating, and this combines you know, work and uh, hobbies with underwater video and photography, is the diversity of both habitats and animals that are in Western Australia. Um, I've probably spent about eight and a half thousand hours underwater over the last uh, 35 years, um, to the point where I'm having problems with my ears and having to get surgery done. But Western Australia has an amazing range of habitats going from the real tropical north, the muddy waters of the Kimberley, down through the Pilbara to the coral reefs of Ningaloo and down that coast to the Houtman Abrolis. Uh, we've got some amazing habitats that remain largely undiscovered, sponge, bed, uh, sponge gardens. Um, this is taken in the uh, Exmouth Gulf 
out by the jetty about a kilometer and a half off in a place that no one dives and yet it's got some of the greatest colors and shapes you'll ever find. We've got some of the largest areas of seagrass in the world. Um, there are really weird fish and then we start getting into the pelagic. Um, it's absolutely incredible the environment that you've got here and it's only when you get to know it you realize how little we know. So this is my plug for marine science. Um, we know more about the surface of the moon than what we know about the seafloor. And that's particularly true of Western Australia. We have something like 71% of the Earth's surface is covered by oceans. At its deepest, it's 11,000 metres and has 3,800 metre um, average. There's more than 300 times space for life in the sea than there is on land or water. Earth is about Four, four and a half, well, four, four thousand six hundred million years old. The oceans formed very early on, and there's more phyla of animals in the sea than on land and in fresh water. And most of the species, and this is particularly true in Western Australia, are undescribed, and particularly for those marine invertebr invertebrates. We don't really fully understand the ecosystem services and processes that the ocean provides, but we do know that probably provides 70 to 80 percent of our oxygen. It regulates the climate in terms of temperature and rainfall. And what is really scary is we are beginning to understand now that climate change is going to have a major impact on it. It's going to affect things like increasing the sea surface temperature will change the stratification, will affect circulation and productivity, we're going to have increased acidification and loss of oxygen. We're probably going to have biodiversity losses and invasions. And with the heat waves that we've seen over the last 20 years since I've been here, we've already seen a tropicalization of the marine communities where things that are found further north are moving south. And that's another talk I can give another day or get one of my students to do. We've got real problems with coastal erosion and pollution. And this is part of the Anthropocene. Um, yeah, it's just a fact. We've caused changes. We're not going to put things back in the box. And we need smart people to actually think about how we solve some of the problems and the challenges. So what are the challenges that are related to the ocean? Well, the biggest one for us is going to be food security. And we've seen in places like Pakistan, um, we've had major floods, we've had droughts in other places. We're not producing the food that we need. Water security is going to be a big one. And after this winter, I'm sure people will go, water security? We don't have problems with water security, but in many places around the world, we do. Um, with the war in Ukraine, we know that we've got real problems with energy and we've been dependent on hydrocarbons as a form of generating energy for far too long. We need to go towards new solutions. And the biggest problem that people don't really want to talk about is the fact that we're going to have a uh, increasing population size that's going to demand more and more resources. This is taken from this figure is taken from a paper by Daniel Pauli and colleagues out of um, uh, Canada. It was in a Nature paper in the mid 90s. And it basically predicts the decimation of marine fish stocks because we're using them as a major source of food and that things are going to get smaller and smaller. We're going to be eating further and further down the food chain. And that's happening. Um, so we need to think about alternative ways. We need to think about some neat ways of management. For example, this is a paper that we published two years ago in Nature uh, from a thing called the Global Finprint um, involving probably about 100, 140 scientists and looking at the conservation status of reef sharks. And we know that we have got sanctuary zones, the blue bump at the top, you tend to have more sharks. We know that we have got gill nets, long lines or drum lines. You tend to have lower populations of sharks. Where you've got hook and line, um, you've got closed areas, you've got large sizes of closed areas, and you've got catch limits, you tend to have more sharks. Western Australia is pretty lucky in that we have really good fisheries management in comparison to many other parts of the world. So our shark populations are actually pretty good and pretty high. And uh, what you'll find is we have a lot of 
both commercial and recreational fishers talking about depredation where they're losing a lot of fish to sharks. The simple fact is with all the global challenges we've got, we are going to need to harvest resources from the marine environment more and more. The other thing that we're finding is that wild capture in the blue is decreasing, but aquaculture is increasing and is one real possible way of feeding the world. We've got to do aquaculture really smart so it doesn't actually impact the environment. And one of the things we also have to recognise is we've got water shortages. Marine food production through aquaculture is probably the only sector that doesn't actually use a lot of fresh water. And it's probably going to be one of our, one of our primary sources of protein if we actually want sustainability and we need to be thinking about it. So here's my plug for marine science. We need lots of really smart people coming into marine science to actually solve some of the challenges that we've got. And a lot of people think about marine science as biology and ecology. Yeah, it's part of that, but that's a, that's a small part of it in my mind. We need people working in social science. We need people working in engineering, chemistry, archaeology, geology. We need to change the marine laws. And as far as I'm concerned, someone working in maritime law is a marine scientist. Um, we need people going into management with the government agencies that have knowledge, real knowledge, about the challenges and can think creatively about the solutions. Fisheries and conservation management and research is obvious, but we also need people going into aquaculture. So when you think about marine studies and marine science, think very, very broadly, because it's a huge bag of opportunities in terms of careers. Right, here's where I owe um, Haley an apology. And John, because I've changed the title because it actually made a lot more sense to scale up given the nature of the global issues that we're talking about. So I've changed it to man-made marine structures, challenges and opportunities in Western Australia. And I guess the key thing to do is to start talking about what is man-made marine infrastructure? Well, it can include a lot of things. It can include things like the Bustleton Jetty, um, which is one of the major tour, tour the highest uh, numbers of visitors to any um, tourist structure in Western Australia. And it, it has, I don't know if you've ever done any um, diving on it, but the fish life is pretty amazing. The invertebrate life on the pylons is incredible. And it's also a, a place that's really popular with recreational fishers. There's so many things going on there. Other examples of man-made marine infrastructure include shipwrecks. And we only have to think about the swan that's in Geograph Bay that was deliberately scuttled after it had been cleaned up as a diving location. This is effectively a sanctuary zone. And there's people that go out here pretty much every day during the summer. It's a deep dive um, down at the bow. Um, but if any of you are into scuba diving, and um, I'd highly recommend this one. It's pretty amazing. What about other types of infrastructure that you mightn't really think about? Um, you think about the rock walls and the groins that are around the Fremantle Harbour, and they get used by people who are diving, by fishing, people snorkelling, you name it. They're there as a protection for the vessels and ships that are inside. Um, the rock wall that goes from uh, Point Perrin out to Garden Island is another really good example of a man-made structure. And in actual fact, we have something like 7,400 man-made structures in Western Australian waters, and these include artificial reefs, oil and gas platforms, the navigation aids, um, offshore petroleum wells and pipelines, shipwrecks, public boat ramps, tidal stations, other types of coastal infrastructure, you name it, it's huge. And you only have to have a think about around Perth and you'll be able to identify a whole heap of different types of uh, man-made infrastructure. And if we look at the Northwest Shelf, that's just an example of the infrastructure that's there. The green are oil and gas wells, the red are platforms, the black line are pipelines. And when you zoom in on this picture, it gets more and more and more. All the little red flags are um, shipping infrastructure, channel markers, things like that. So we've got a lot of man-made infrastructure. And I think one of the things that we really need to be thinking about is what is the impact? So there's a term that started becoming um, more common during the mid 2000s about ocean sprawl. 
and what the impact of that was on marine ecosystems. And it includes things like cemented shorelines, breakwaters, harbours, um, shipping channels, there's all the buoys and mooring. We've got to think about uh, all the recreational activities and boats and sailing that occurs, commercial shipping, aquaculture, fishing, artificial reefs. Um, there's something like eight, uh, probably eight to 9,000 oil and gas rigs throughout the world. <clears throat> and we're going to see an increasing amount of offshore energy with wind farms. So what I wanted to do today was start talking about what the ecological and social values of man-made marine structure are, and also whether there are any economic values. I also want to talk about what the negatives are and what are the opportunities. And to do this, I'm going to present a couple of case studies that I've worked on. The first is with the Exmouth Integrated Artificial Reef, which was put out in 2018, if I remember correctly, as a place where recreational fishers could go and target species that were in the Gulf in relatively safe um, location close to a harbour. So um, there were all up about um, 60, 59 structures that were put in place. There were six big steel tanks that you'll see on the top left. And these are subsurface buoys that have had cables on them from the oil and gas industry. These were donated and cleaned up by BHP. Um, there were a number of concrete modules, um, the pyramids on the left, the habitats in the middle, and the small Apollos, which are only about waist high on the right. So we were fortunate enough that we got involved right at the beginning of the project and were able to do some monitoring. Artificial reefs are becoming a really popular thing and increasing in number. So there's a big one oh, about five kilometers, 10 kilometers south of Rottnest and 42 meters of water. There are two big fish towers and they have been specifically put there for um, recreational fishermen and they're in 42, 43 meters of water. So they're not really accessible. So with the Exmouth Artificial Reef, we asked a number of questions. How do the fish assemblage change over time? Um, how do the fish assemblages at the artificial reef compare to natural habitats? And what were the differences between the four locations? So um, Sony were involved in this program working with uh, Wreckfish West, and we deployed stereo bruvs at the artificial reef, at sand sites and at natural reef sites. We also did ROV transects um, at the same sort of sites, but what we did was we also included some of the sponge gardens that were further down the Gulf um, and quite amazing. What did it look like? So we sampled before and after and the artificial reef is in the, the blue, the natural reef in the red and the sand habitats in the brown. And basically what we found is the number of species at the artificial reef increased really quickly and then slowed down a little bit, but were largely comparable to the natural reef. And surprisingly, the sand habitats actually had a lot of species. When we started looking at the mean number of fish, the fish that were attracted to the artificial reefs was huge in comparison to the natural habitats. And this was in large associated with small fish coming into the artificial reef into the towers. So when we think about some of the common species, uh, Legina sabae, which is one of the uh, red emperor, one of the, the main species commercial and recreational fishermen like to catch, their numbers of fish took off greatly. Similarly with some of the carangids, which we also saw at some of the other habitats and particularly on sand where they swim through in schools. Um, Caridon cordoroma, we saw in large numbers come into the reef initially, and then their numbers settled down. Um, higher the natural reef initially, and then lower afterwards. And the same with tarwine. What we did see with the assemblage, each one of these dots synthesizes all the sampling that we did at any one place at any one time. And you'll see that the samples on the left, the brown ones, are all sort of clumped together, so the sand hasn't changed too much. The natural reefs very similar apart from the first time. And then you'll see that the blue lines show you how the sampling has changed over time. And what we've seen is that the sampling, the, the fish on the artificial reef have built up 
and stabilized. And then we've got a lot of really large fish like Queensland gropers and cods that have come in. We did the same thing with the ROV. The results were a little bit more scattered, but we had a similar pattern. But here you'll notice that we've got the green dots off to the left, which is the sponge. So let's have a quick look at the ROV transects. Similar pattern, number of species built up, but note that we've got a lot of species that are living in the sponge habitats. Mean number of fish was still way higher on the artificial reef. Tends to indicate that um, possibly had a, uh, quite a few small fish there. But when you look at the biomass, the estimated weight from the length, the artificial reef was really high. The natural reef had a lot of variability, but the sponge gardens also had really high biomass. So when we look at the, the difference between the, the types of structures, the habitats, the little ones, um, were the fish towers actually had a really high number of uh, fish on them. And again, the sponge, uh, the, uh, the pyramids, which I didn't think would work that well, actually had a high number of species. When we look at the mean number of fish, the larger fish towers were incredible. And similarly, when we start looking at the biomass, um, the fish towers had consistent biomass and on the pyramids and in the habitats, you'll see there's a couple of spikes which were caused by schooling corangids coming through and just swamping the, the data. When we think about it from a species specific, um, some of those big cods were only associated with the fish towers where they could actually get under and it was a bit like a cave. Um, Lugianus Bay were associated with all the structures. Um, Lugianus carpinitatus, again, all the structures. But what was really interesting is Saganus fusins, which is a herbivore, was more associated with the fish towers and that's because it was grazing off the algae that was sitting on top of the fish towers that was growing on it. So um, the fish towers extended up into the water column about 10 to 15 metres, and there was lots of algae growing on top. So what was the overall conclusion? Um, the number of species fish and biomass at King Reef increased really quickly. There were higher numbers of species fish and biomass than natural habitats in general, with the exception of the sponge gardens. There were different fish assemblages associated with different structures. And in general, there were more fish and species associated with the large structures. And we've really got to think about how we design artificial reefs if we actually want to maximise their potential. But we can learn from things that are already in the environment. And a good example is oil and gas infrastructure, where we've got the mid-depth buoys, we've got the uh, anchor chains, we've got hoses, we've got pylons. And one of the things that we've done over the last um, seven years is a lot of surveying of some of these different structures. And I'm gonna point out a case study from Thailand uh, that we published last year, and that's because it's actually really quite dramatic. And we asked the questions, were the jackets, how were the fish associated with the jackets different in comparison to the natural habitats, which was sediment? So what would happen if the jackets were taken away? And also given these jackets come out of the seafloor by about 80 meters, 60 to 80 metres, were there depth differences in the assemblage composition and biomass of the fish as you went down the jacket? So first of all, four families of fish on the sediment, 18 on the jackets, five and 66, five species and 66 fish on the sediment, 42 species and 16,674 fish on the uh, jackets, and this is with the same amount of sampling. Um, the sediments were dominated by small corangids and jacks, whereas the on the jackets, they were dominated by pomace entrance and damselfish, which are reef affiliated, reef associated fish. So in the sediment, most of the species were pelagic, whereas 99% were of the fish on, on the jackets were coral reef or coral reef associated. And the biomass on the jackets was actually enormous in comparison to the biomass in the sediment sites. So these areas have the potential to hold a lot of fish. We saw a difference in the depth gradient, um, basically a coral reef fish assemblage at the top and a deeper water demersal fish assemblage down the bottom. And we also saw big differences in the number of species, number of fish, um, really high numbers of fish up the top and then decreased. But what you also, we also found was there was quite high biomass at different depths. So I guess 
One of the things that I really want to point out is some of these offshore oil and gas platforms are really unique, novel ecosystems. And if we think about it in context, a colleague of mine, Alan Freelander, um, surveyed all the uh, a whole heap of sites through the main Hawaiian Islands and Northwest Hawaiian Islands and came up with an estimate of what the biomass of fish per unit area was and converted into per hectare. And he estimated that the best marine reserve in the Northwest Hawaiian Islands, which are really remote, you'd have 4.64 tons of fish in an area per hectare. We estimated that there'd be something like 61 tons of fish per hectare in an area where there was um, a, a couple of jackets. So, you know, 12, 13 times more, it's incredible. We don't really know about what's happening with pipelines, but we do know that they are quite unique ecosystems as well. So major differences between natural sites and jackets, and we've found that in other places. Um, many of the, the species on the jackets were coral reef associated and they were highly stratified by depth, which has real implications for decommissioning these structures or building new artificial reefs. And that effectively, because we had a vertical structure coming out of the, the sea floor, which is very much like a, a, a pinnacle, we had a, a really high standing biomass of fish. And that's because it's equivalent to a high rise apartment. Yeah, you, know, you can pack more people in. What we also found was there were depth extensions for some of the species that were living on those jackets. We'd never seen them deeper. And that's because it's such a small vertical distance to go up and down. It has important implications for climate refugia. So who uses man-made structures? Recreational fishers, scuba divers, commercial fishing, lots of people use them. Do man-made structures have economic value? Yeah. Um, we estimate that the Exmouth Navy Pier contributes about a million dollars a year, both direct and indirectly, indirect through accommodation to the Exmouth economy. Busselton Jetty will have something between six and 20, probably about $18 million that goes into the Busselton economy as a result of people coming to it. So in terms of values, we know that they increased habitat. We know that there is the potential for rehabilitation or creation of new coral reef systems through man-made structure. We know that they provide for an increase in fish stocks. People think that they have the potential to spread pressure on natural reefs, so recreational fishers and commercial fishers go specifically to these. We know through the discussion about um, the role of um, man-made infrastructure that it increases the awareness and the appreciation of what is in the marine environment. And we're able to gain evidence of the benefits of artificial reefs. We also know that man-made structures create jobs, employment and tourism opportunities. And it creates an opportunity to test novel techniques for building better resilience in communities, marine communities in the face of climate change. There is a potential for pollution from poorly thought out or maintain, maintained infrastructure on the negative. Um, incremental impacts to adjacent areas and species. So in the past, artificial reefs have been made of things like tires and they've just spread out over the seafloor and caused pollution. Um, and there are questions about who is actually responsible. And no one really knows, possibly the Department of Fisheries. Um, there is a thought that they have the ability to negatively change the environment, but there are also opportunities for artificial reefs, for example, the uh, Bustleton Jetty to be used to provide education for users. Um, one of the opportunities for future projects, and we think about the Westport dredging and the creation of the Outer Harbour and Fremantle, um, there's a real opportunity to value add to it by engaging community members in design and also to recognize um, competing interests. So just to wind up, man-made marine structures have real high social and economic values, um, and we need more information on them to import, incorporate into policy and decision-making, which I think is probably more important than the ecological information. Yes, there are concerns, uh, and particularly in around things like um, invasive species, but in general, many stakeholders see opportunities. The potential sites of resource conflict, for example, um, a lot of recreational fishermen don't like people doing diving in the same areas they're fishing.
we've got 7,400 man-made structures in Western Australia now, and there's going to be many more in the future with um, the proposed offshore wind farms and new infrastructure going in for ports and other developments. So we need to think about how we can optimise the outcomes by doing eco-engineering, uh, making them greener, um, defining their purpose, getting stakeholders involved and talking about resource allocation. Possibly we need to change some of the policy. And when we think about the role for habitat restoration and enhancement, it's huge. We've already got oyster reefs going in around the country. Um, we've got commercial farming through things like coral farming, the abalone down at um, Augusta. And we've got in some places around the world, artificial reefs being created specifically for finfish fishing, such as in China, Korea and India, as a way of enhancing production. So there are benefits and there are discussions. Um, this work is not mine alone. There's a whole heap of people who have been involved. I'm going to flick through because I want to ask questions. So at that point, John, I am going to come back to you. We've been talking about the the, the aggregation versus production debate, um, you know, in, in an evaluation of artificial reefs. We do like to look at the positives and negatives um, where, where there's, you know, positives abound for sure. But could you expand a bit on the uh, that aggregation versus production debate? Yeah, look, it's a really interesting one, John, and one of the big ones that comes out in debates. Um, initially, when infrastructure gets placed in the water, it does attract fish. So, for example, all those uh, Lejanus Bay, they didn't just grow on that site. They came in. So things are being attracted. But over time, if you've got a healthy ecosystem, things will start to produce eggs and spawn. You'll see growth on structures, which is production. And we might find that some of the artificial reefs and uh, structures themselves are actually sources of um, larvae and production that way that then spill over into other areas, the same way as artificial, as um, marine reserves. Um, certainly in Thailand, we believe that if they take the 400, 500 platforms that are there out, we'll see a collapse in the fishery and a collapse of the reef fish communities because they are effectively 400 protected areas. Um, and we're looking at when you're looking at those those shapes um, or even surfaces, is there is there research into what shapes are working better or whether to make them out of metal or concrete or should we be synthesizing a new like um, you know surface to enhance the you know um, recruitment of maybe coral species or things like that? Um, John, that's a really good question, and the answer is yes to all of it. We need to be doing the whole lot. But first of all, before we do that, we need to actually define what the purpose is. So if it's something that's there to enhance corals, then we actually need to be providing a substrate where corals can recruit to. If it's about fin fish, then we need to be creating a whole heap of ecological niches. And I think we can integrate both, but a lot of the people who are building artificial reefs at the moment are not thinking about that. But we also need to be thinking about things like new opportunities, for example, the offshore wind energy. And whether we can actually create or value add structures as part of the EPA uh, terms to those structures, whether it's complement with artificial reefs, put something in the water column, whatever, to actually enhance production and uh, growth and ecological opportunities. What's really clear for reef fish is that we only have a small amount of reef, whether it's coral reef or limestone or granite, on the continental shelf. And I'm not saying that sand habitats aren't valuable, but the majority of our food fish are coming off those reefs. Maybe it's a way we can increase production in the marine environment.